Good morning everyone and welcome to the second panel of the day, um, which is on memory, perhaps the most important um, phenomenon with regards to the uh, Spanish Civil War in, in, in the 21st century. Um, I'm Matthew Kerry, a PhD student here in the Department of History where I studied Asturias during the 1930s. Uh, and I'm very pleased to welcome our three speakers on this panel. Uh, we're going to start with, uh, as in the programme, with Georgina Blakely, who is Senior Lecturer in Politics at The Open University. She researches both the issues of democracy and democratisation in uh, Spanish pop politics and citizen participation in urban governance, and has published widely on these issues, looking at Spain, Barcelona and also Manchester, including a recent book on the regeneration of East Manchester. Uh, and she'll be talking about the implementing of Spain's reparation law, a sharp tool or a blunt instrument. She'll be followed by Dacia Viejo Rose, who is British Academy Postdoctoral Fellow and Research Associate in the MacDonald Institute for Archaeolog Archaeological Research, quite a mouthful, at the <laughs> University of Cambridge. Uh, she researches and has published on the nexus between uh, cultural heritage and the politics of the past, including a book entitled uh, Reconstructing Spain, Cultural Heritage and Memory After Civil War, uh, which I believe is the result of a thesis. And she'll be talking about the legacies of cultural violence and the Spanish Civil War. And finally, uh, at the very end, we have Gareth, Gareth Stocky, who is lecturer at the Department of Spanish, Portuguese and Latin American Studies at the University of Nottingham. He researches and teaches on, history, on the history and historical memory of modern Spain, uh, and recently published a book on the uh, Valley of the Fallen, and has also published volumes on the history of Gibraltar. And he'll be talking about El Valle de los Caídos uh, in the recent Spanish memory wars. Okay, so we'll start with Jordina Biden. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, and thank you particularly to the organisers. It's a real pleasure to be here today, and one doesn't always say that at uh, conferences, so, so thank you very much. Um, and also congratulations to all the students who produced the posters, which I think are really fantastic, and I'm hoping we're going to have more time to talk about those. They really are very impressive. Um, I'm going to talk about the reparation law, uh, popularly known as the historical memory law, uh, which was approved on 26th of December 2007. And at the time, I think it's fair to say that it represented a flawed, but nonetheless real step forward in the struggle to gain reparation and public recognition for the victims of the Civil War and the Franquist dictatorship. Now, in previous research that I've done on the reparation law, I've claimed that its strengths were largely related to its symbolism, its recognition for the first time of the victim status of those who suffered during the Civil War and dictatorship, the widespread acceptance from society which it seemed to acquire, and to be honest, the mere fact that such a law existed uh, and had been passed by the majority of political parties, even though the Pessoa government at the time was quite disappointed that approval of the law was only secured by voting article by article, given remaining disagreements, rather than voting on the law in its entirety, uh, which is what it, it really wanted. But whatever the law's initial strengths might have been, I'm going to talk today about how the law has become emptied of content, given the lack of political will to ensure its implementation, and how the weaknesses that were apparent in the law at the time of its approval provide clues to the reasons for its lack of implementation today. And the two weaknesses that I'm going to concentrate on are the definition of memory as a private issue and the refusal to nullify Franquist era rulings. So the first weakness I will focus on is the way in which the law framed memory as a private matter. And as I will explain, the consequences that then flow from this privatisation. Now, the Pessoa government attached a great deal of importance to protecting each individual's right to their personal and family memory. And this is very clear in Article 1 of the law, which states that the aim of the law is to recognise and extend rights to those who suffered persecution or violence for reasons of politics, <coughs> ideology or religious belief, during the Civil War and the dictatorship to promote their moral reparation and the recovery of their personal and family memory. Now, to some extent, this focus is understandable given the extent to which Republican memories were silenced 
not just during, not just within the public sphere, but also to some extent within the private sphere of the family too. And this focus was also in tune with the socialist government's broad ethical agenda at that time, which was based on the extension of rights to various uh, communities and collectives. But the privatisation of memory denotes an approach to dealing with the past which is grounded on notions of personal guilt and innocence. And this contrasts sharply with the approach advocated by most of the historical memory associations, which articulate a discourse of universal human rights rather than individual victimhood. And they define Franco's crimes as crimes against humanity. But the extent to which memory is framed as a private <coughs> issue, however, also denotes the lack of responsibility the state displays towards the victims. And it's telling, for example, that one area where there were significant changes between the draft bill and the final law related precisely to the central state's responsibility in ensuring that the law was implemented. So in response to pressures from the PSOE's main negotiating partners, and we shouldn't forget that in the Pessoa's 2004 manifesto, there was only one mention of historical memory. So it was really the kind of the fact that it was a minority government and had to respond to pressures from other parties that this issue really kind of moved forward. And in response to these pressures, a new paragraph was inserted into the preamble of the final law to ensure that the public authorities carry out public policies aimed at promoting knowledge of Spain's history and democratic memory. And certainly there were a lot of additions between the first draft and the final law, which concentrated on trying to improve and add to the Spain's role, particularly in regard to educating its citizens about uh, the past. And the state's role in carrying out other aspects of the law was also strengthened in numerous respects. In Article 11 of the final draft, previously Article 13, there was a greater emphasis on central state responsibility vis-à-vis -vis the mass uh, civil war graves, which obliged the state to draw up work plans and to award grants to ensure that the civil war graves are located and uh, opened. Article 12 of the final draft, previously Article 14, similarly obliges the central state to assume a more proactive role in this area requiring the central state to establish a protocol to regulate exhumations and to produce a map of all the civil war graves. In Article 15, previously Article 17 in the draft, relating to the removal of Francoist symbols, the central state now has to take responsibility for the removal of symbols at all levels of the state, not just at those levels under central state uh, jurisdiction. And two new clause were added, clauses were added to this article. Clause 3 obliges the central state to collaborate with regional governments and local councils to produce a catalogue of remaining symbols of the civil war and the dictatorship, while Clause 4 refers to the possible withdrawal of public grants from those bodies which fail to remove Franco's uh, symbols. On a similar note, Article 17, previously Article 19, places a new responsibility on the central state to produce a census of buildings and public works which were built by forced labour under the Franquist dictatorship. Now, what this brief outline shows of changes between the first draft of the bill and the, and the final law is that attempts were made to strengthen the state's role in the period of, of these negotiations. Um, so that it was assuming sufficient responsibility with regard to its obligations in truth, justice and reparation. Yet this brief outline, by highlighting some of the key functions assigned to the state, also serves to highlight the extent to which it has failed to implement key aspects of the law since its approval. Now, some progress was made under the final years of the Socialist Administration, <clears throat> But even then, progress on the location of mass graves, the exhumation of bodies, or the removal of Franquist symbols too often depended on the will of regional and local governments, often in the hands of the right-wing Pepe, which remained hostile to the implementation of some aspects of the law. Now, the victory of the Pepe in the 2011 general elections simply transferred this local and regional intransigence to the national stage. <coughs> Under the cover of the economic recession, it has been argued that the Pepe has effectively repealed the law by withdrawing its funding. 
The first cuts came in the 2012 budget when the 6.2 million euros of the last socialist executive were slashed by 60% <coughs> to 2.5 million, destined exclusively for the opening of graves. But even this proved to be a chimera, as the associations waited in vain for the call for grants, which was never published in the BOI, in the uh, official bulletin of the state. In 2013, and again in 2014, no state funds at all have been allocated to the tasks of the historical memory movement. And the Pepe government has also shown its reluctance to act with regard to the value of the fallen. And I won't say much about this because obviously Gareth's the expert on, on, on this um, topic. But in particular, it has disregarded the report of the Committee of Experts, which was asked to study the issue under the previous socialist government. And one of its chief proposals was to remove the remains of Franco to another place, as, to quote, the only way of assigning a different meaning to the monument and to provide some solace to the children and grandchildren of those Republicans who were buried in the ma mausoleum without their consent. Although the Pepe government was in power when the report was finally presented, the Basque socialist MP Ramon Jauregui asked Rajoy to not simply put it in a drawer. Yet it seems that that is simply what he has done. In this case, it's more difficult to put in action down to a lack of funding. Because on the 17th of May 2013, the government published in the BOI a public invitation to tender worth 287,000 euros to restore the fa facade of the Basilica of the Valley of the Fallen, which is deteriorating quite considerably. In response, the MP Ramon Haragi asked the government if it was going to adopt any of the measures outlined in the report from the Committee of Experts. The government replied in writing that it had no intention of acting to change the meaning of the monument, stating that, to quote, with regard to actions pertaining to completely changing the meaning of the value of the fallen, as proposed in the report of the Experts Commission, it is necessary to point out that this would require the maximum consensus in order not to reopen unnecessary wounds. Consensus, the opening of unnecessary wounds, of course, is a phrase that the paper uses continually. As part of the austerity program in 2012, the Pepe government also closed the Office of Assistance to Victims of the Civil War and Dictatorship, created in 2008. The functions of this office, such as the development of the Graves Map, were transferred to the División de Derechos de Gracia y Otros uh, Derechos. I'm trying to kind of work out how best to translate this in, into English, but it's something like the pardon division, which is kind of what I've come up with, but it's a division within the, the Ministry of Justice. If anyone's got a better way, please, please help me with that. But this nomenclature, I think, gets to the heart of why the state has effectively failed to implement the reparation law. And I think its act, inaction, rather, is much less to do with financial difficulties and much more to do with how it perceives its role with regard to historical memory because the state acts as if any action with regard to truth, justice and reparation is voluntary rather than obligatory. And this is an argument put forward by Javier Chinchon Alvarez, who argues that all measures adopted in relation to the past are afforded as a matter of grace, hence the División de, de Derechos de Gracia, and not obligation. He points out, for example, that the Supreme Court has admitted that the historical memory law implies nothing more than, to quote, the mere collaboration with private persons, again, privatization, the individualization of these issues, and the contribution of public powers in the desired reparation of the victims of the Civil War and the dictatorship that followed. Alicia Hill, uh, another legal expert working in this area, also agrees with this argument and adds that the task of gaining compensation or recognition as a matter of grace is made even more difficult given that it's the responsibility of the victims to provide evidence to support any claims they make, which of course is extraordinarily difficult to do. And this shortcoming also applies to the right to request a declaration of reparation and personal recognition, which is issued by the pardons office, and requires citizens to complete a form and provide evidence of the facts leading them to request a certificate of recognition and moral restitution. Now, according to the Pepe Minister for Justice, Alberto Ruiz Galeron, defending his government's record in this area in December 2013, 
222 declarations of personal recognition had already been signed. Now, just briefly, there are a couple of aspects that are really troubling about this figure. First, to provide this figure as proof of his government's activity in the area of, of justice and reparation is troublesome, as 222 declarations is surely small in the face of even the most conservative of estimates of the number of victims to whom such a declaration might apply. And secondly, and much more straightforward, the figures simply don't add up. Um, the Spanish government's own historical memory website declares that more than 950 people have already gained a declaration. Again, in response to criticisms of his government's inactivity, the PP Minister for Justice, Gallardón, in the autumn of 2013, declared that the government was fulfilling its obligations under the law and was managing the map of graves, adding that in 2013, 27 new locations had been added, bringing the number to 2,382. Although recognising that the recession had meant a lack of funding for the associations, he claimed that since 2006 they had received 25 million euros and that most of the requests to locate and exhume bodies were made as soon as the law was passed, such that the location and exhumation of the most important graves had already been carried out um, until 2011. But this is a deeply cynical statement which fails to clarify that of those two, 25 million euros, 20 million corresponded to the period 2006 to 2011 under the socialist governments. And moreover, the historical memory associations claim that of those 2,382 mass graves identified, less than 400 had been opened, thereby directly disputing the government view expressed by the Secretary of State for Justice, Fernando Roman, in 2012, that, to quote, the work to carry out the law has been almost finished. So in short, the state shows little appetite for any of the duties ascribed to it by the reparation law. And the Spanish state's inaction has received criticism from the UN Special Envoy, en Envoy? Envoy for the Promotion of Truth, Justice and Reparation, who visited Spain to assess what was being done to help the victims of Francoism. Pablo de Grief insisted on the need for the government to have a state policy, which I think is telling in itself, to provide reparation for the victims of Francoism. And he criticised the state for leaving the responsibility of finding and opening civil war graves in the hands of the families, claiming that the model of privatisation of the exhumations makes it easier for state institutions to maintain their difference. In fact, during the 10 days that he spent in Spain, interviewing government members, judges and victims, what he found particular, particularly striking was, to quote, the immense distance between state, state institutions and victims, stressing never in his 20 years of experience has he come across anything like this. So the distancing of the state from his, its responsibilities to provide truth, justice and reparation is a result of the fact that the state sees its role as discretionary rather than obligatory, and hence memory work in Spain is essentially privatised. And this discretionary nature of the state is also evidenced by the fact that the UN's envoys, who visited previously in, in 2013, noted that the treatment of victims depends enormously on the political party which is in government in each particular uh, region. And I think there is also a link between this discretionary role of the state and another key weakness of the reparation law, namely its failure to nullify Francoist era rulings, despite the fact that there do exist precedents elsewhere in Europe, not the least, for example, the right-wing CDU government in Germany, which passed the law to nullify unjust national socialist sentences on 25th of August 1998 which effectively declared the entire apparatus of Wehrmacht justice as unjust, null and void. Instead, and this was only after intense pressures from its negotiating partners, the PSOE agreed to declare Francoist era rulings illegitimate, but it was at pains to stress that this declaration of illegitimacy had no legal effect. So the inactivity of the executive branch of the Spanish state with regard to the reparation law is thus replicated in the judicial branch 
of the Spanish state, where the overriding tendency has been to claim that there exists no legal obligation to open a criminal investigation into the crimes that took place during the Civil War and under Franco. Yet, it's possible to go beyond that and actually argue that the judiciary has gone beyond mere inactivity to a position of active dissuasion. Following a visit to Spain in 2013, in, in September that year, the UN's envoys for the UN Working Group on Forced Disappearances explained the fact that no other judge had dared to undertake investigations following Garthon's attempt in 2008 because of the, the dissuasive effect of Garthon's trial and the subsequent Supreme Court's verdict in March 2012, which essentially has closed down any possibility of investigating crimes Franco's crimes as crimes against humanity, given that it argued that this crime did not exist at the time and that therefore these crimes have also expired. And the Supreme Court, very much in contrary to international law, also declared the argument that about the permanence of the crime of forced disappearance, which of course Garthon used to great effect against Pinochet, as lacking in plausibility. So this ruling goes completely against the recommendations of the UN, whose envoys concluded that the executive should assume its responsibility and develop a national plan to locate the disappeared, to repeal the amnesty law and judge forced disappearances in Spain. Because according to the UN, and contrary to the Spanish Supreme Court, forced disappearance is a permanent crime which is not prescribed. So it urged the Spanish state to fulfil its international obligations, to classify this crime within the, the Spanish Criminal Code, to repeal the 1977 Amnesty Law, and to judge the more than um, 1, 114,000 disappearances detailed by Baltasar Garzón in his 2008 judgment. At a minimum, they requested the Spanish government to provide every judicial support to any ongoing legal trial begun in other countries, of course referring to the trials which are ongoing in, in Argentina at the time. The subsequent visit by the UN Special Envoy, uh, Pablo de Grief, reiterated those concerns. He repeated the request to repeal the amnesty law, given that in reality, he claimed, in Spain, this worked as a full stop law, given that it had been used to archive nearly all the cases which come before the judiciary. And he argued that in other countries where amnesty laws had not been annulled, the courts had been able to interpret such laws in ways which had not prevented proceedings against those presumed to be responsible. In Spain, however, he argued that the amnesty law is constantly invoked to prevent victims from gaining access to justice. And he also spoke about his concern about the National Court's refusal to, grant extra, uh, to pay attention to the extradition request from Argentina concerning two suspected Franquist tortures. The central state's failure to implement the law, both within the executive and judicial branches, explains the recourse of relatives of the disappeared and the historical memory movement to regional levels of government in Spain, to supranational levels of government in the form of the EU and the, or the UN, and to other states, for example, Argentina, where currently Judge Maria Servini is investigating several crimes committed during Francoism, having proved that the Spanish state is unwilling to try these crimes itself. Uh, and I think I'm coming to the end of my time slot, yes, is that right? Course, so. Okay. Um, so I can tell you a bit more perhaps in the discussion about some of the um, initiatives which are currently taking place in, in Andalusia, which is actually kind of proving to um, go much further than the state level national memory law with its own draft democratic memory bill. Uh, and perhaps tell you a bit more about kind of what's going at the U on at the UN level and also the level of the European Union. But what then, to conclude, can the final balance sheet be on the reparation law? Well, I think ultimately one has to conclude that the negatives outweigh the positives, even setting to one side the weaknesses that the law had as a piece of legislation. The fact that its implementation has been hampered not just by the lack of funding, but by the lack of any political will to carry out the tasks and roles detailed in the law, means that it's been entirely emptied of content, and it perhaps then loses its main strength, which was its symbolism. So what can this lead us to conclude about the Spanish state? Well, I think there is a danger that along with the reparation law, the state itself becomes emptied of content, as its legitimacy and authority becomes contested 
and ultimately eroded by states at regional level, by supranational organisations and by other nation states. And in 2007, when discussions over the reparation law were at their height, Sempere wrote in El País that here and now, a law to recognise victims has more value for the state than for the victims. It is the state which is asserting its own claim to be a representative of the people by condemning the coup d'etat and its political and legal effects. Arguably, the state has failed in asserting this claim of representation, and in so doing, it loses legitimacy and authority and shows its ultimate weakness. Thank you.